The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and he said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch, touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer, and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You, you are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. In some ways, uh, just for me today, uh, and, and maybe for you too, uh, just the, the reception of new members and this baptism today, these are really the sermon. These are really the good news. We have, uh, the COVID pandemic has kept us uh, for far too long from being the kind of inviting and welcoming congregation that, that we are called to be. And uh, I realize we still are... Uh, slowly moving out of that and want to take that social distancing seriously but that again it's just a a good news good news day that we can um, just recognize those who have been so patient with us and i want to say that loud and clear thank you uh, to you new members who have been patient uh, patiently waiting kind of this public recognition that you are uh committing yourselves to, to be disciples with us in Christ's work. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Moses had to be convinced that God could defeat Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the planet, that God could overturn the reality of slavery and the corrupt power behind it. Abraham had to be convinced that God could bring forth an heir from his and Sarah's old bodies to fulfill God's promise that, that there would be a nation more numerous than the stars in the sky or the sand on the, on the, on the seashore as their descendants. Jacob had to be convinced that God could soften his brother Esau's heart even after Jacob had stolen Esau's birthright and his father's precious blessing. As that reunion took shape, Jacob, Jacob took steps to soften Esau's heart on his own. He's sending gifts ahead of him, gifts of livestock, clothing, and wealth. But when Esau saw Jacob... He rejected those gifts. He told Jacob, keep those gifts, and he embraced his brother. And he welcomed him home in that embrace. And we're told in that encounter that Jacob saw the face of God in his brother Esau. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, a, a text that we'll get to in a few weeks, Peter had to be convinced that God truly shows no partiality, that God's mission was not only to the Israelites or the Jewish people, but also to the non-Jews, 
to every nation, every gender, every race, all are covered by God's grace. And now in today's text, the disciples, the disciples upon seeing the risen Jesus had to be convinced, had to be convinced that it was He in His body resurrected from the dead as He showed them His hands and His feet. They doubted and were afraid. These scriptural giants had to be convinced because God's plan was always bigger, always broader, always more inclusive, more more freeing, more life-giving than their limited vision could see or imagine. What makes you think? What makes you think that you would be any different? You and I, too, must be convinced that death That life can rise up out of death when God is involved. Last week I appreciated Anne's sermon, uh, a sermon that you can find online. uh, A sermon reminding us that fear and doubt are are, uh, not exclusive to doubting Thomas, but are compatible, even a natural part of faith and life. There is proof for what she said in this week's text. For in Luke's gospel, all the disciples were gathered together. When seeing the resurrected living Lord Jesus, they were afraid and filled with doubts. Doubts arose within their hearts. They had to be convinced. When we as human beings who know only, only the limited reality of our existence are confronted with God's reality, with God's kingdom, as we emerge into a realization that God's plan is always bigger, broader, more inclusive, more life-giving than we can see or imagine, there is bound to be fear and doubt, even awe as we awaken to God's good world. Because it's not the world that we see It's often not even the world that we imagine. And so doubt and fear may not only be compatible with, it may be necessary for you and I to embrace the realities of God's good world, God's good kingdom. In today's Gospel, we encounter the resurrected Jesus as He proclaims that same message to His disciples and to you and me. The same message that he proclaimed earlier in Luke's gospel, early in all of the gospels. Repent, Jesus says. And again, we think of repentance most often as, I'm sorry, God. I have sinned. I have failed you. And that is a part of repentance. But as I said when I preached on this earlier, repentance is really to give something a second look, to wrap your mind around it. And Jesus, the the. The Jesus who we knew before his death and resurrection calls for repentance. And the Jesus whom we now know or at least see as the resurrected Jesus calls forth repentance, inviting us to get our minds around this new reality. And there is bound to be fear. There is bound to be doubt. Jesus is proclaiming a reality that we cannot yet fully grasp. For we only know, we know only a limited reality. If you and I truly are trying to repent, to wrap our minds around God's reality, and we should again and again and again, daily, anew every day, trying to wrap our minds around God's reality. A reality that includes the dead being raised to new life. A reality that that includes abundance as its guiding force rather than scarcity. A reality that, that lifts up forgiveness rather than condemnation. A reality that that embraces inclusion rather than exclusion. 
a, a reality that embraces the impossible or the, the possible over the impossible, then there will be fear and doubt as we struggle to embrace that reality that we fully yet cannot see. Because God's plan is, it is always bigger than your plan. It is always bigger than my plan. It is always bigger than the reality that we can see or even imagine. And that means uncertainty. So how is that any different than the world that we live in, this idea of uncertainty? Well, the, this world certainly throws its share of uncertainty at us. None of us would debate that. So the question is, would, would you rather embrace the uncertainties of this world, again, scarcity, non-inclusiveness, unforgivingness, uh, death-dealing, uh, and stand on your own, or would you prefer to embrace the uncertainties of God's kingdom, inclusion, forgiving, life-giving realities, with a God whose plan is not only bigger, but whose power and persistence, whose patience and love and grace is big enough to make it happen. Craig Barnes writes about the world's uncertainties in a Christian Century article titled Savior at Large. He writes, Earlier this week an elderly couple received a phone call from their son who lives far away. Sorry, but we won't be able to visit for the holidays after all. Haven't we all made that phone call or had it over the last year? The grandkids say hello. They assured him that they understood, but as they hung up the phone, they didn't dare look at each other. Earlier this week, a woman was called into her supervisor's office to hear that times are hard for the company and they had to let her go. So sorry. She cleaned out her desk, packed away her hopes of getting ahead, and wondered what she would tell her kids. Earlier this week, someone received terrible news from the, a physician. Someone else heard the words, I don't love you anymore. Earlier this week, he writes, someone's hope was crucified. And the uncertainty of the darkness is overwhelming. No one, Barnes writes, is ready to encounter Easter until he or she has spent time in the dark place where hope cannot be seen. And there, in that dark place, Easter is the last thing we would expect. And that's why it terrifies us so much, he writes. This day is not about bunnies, he says about Easter. It is not about bunnies. It is not about springtime or girls in cute dresses. It's about more hope than we can handle. It's about more hope than we can handle. And when we encounter, are encountered by more hope than we can handle, sometimes, often, it's natural to experience fear and doubt. First, because it means God can do things that, that we don't expect. And second, because it changes how we live in the world. In a world of inclusion, we sing a song like everybody's in. Where in this world are people singing everybody's in? We're divided today by races and education and wealth and poverty. Yet in the church, we sing a song like everybody's in in order that we might live into that reality more and more every day. Friends, as we emerge into the reality of Easter, today we witness a God who receives gracie. Receives gracie by grace. In holy baptism, God receives a little one who has nothing to offer with a plan for her life that's bigger than we can see or imagine. She's waited 
be baptized too. And it's time. We witness God raising up and receiving new, new members, new disciples into this congregation as, as the Spirit's power is upon us with a plan that is bigger than we can see or imagine. We experience, we witness God's welcoming, God's feeding us and all who come to His table. We welcome God's we witness God's welcome to the outsider. And to the outsider, this is a meal of morsels, a meal of bread and wine. But to the believer, it is a foretaste of the feast to come. A feast upon the body and blood, the very real presence of Jesus Christ, the one who has been raised from the dead. A meal that provides nourishment to face life's uncertainties and for a life of faithful witness. We witness God's amazing and limitless grace as we hear, hear God's words to each of us. Your sins are forgiven. Easter. Easter is more hope than we can handle. But yes, Lord, continue to convince us by your grace. Until we embrace fully the goodness of your kingdom, help us. O oh Lord, to build a church, a congregation, to reflect your kingdom life. Let all God's people say, Amen.